Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we introduce our guests, just a couple quick reminders. We are recording this, or rather releasing this, on Tuesday, just three days before the FIDE World Championship. Super excited. So this is your last reminder. Please join the AIM Chess Prediction Challenge, magnusnepo.com. It is free. You can win like a signed wooden board from Magnus that looks amazing. Um, I'll be entering. They told me I'm allowed to enter, so I'm going to... I'm going to get in as soon as I find out who has white in the first game, uh, which will be announced on uh, Thursday at the uh, opening ceremony preceding the World Championship. A couple other quick reminders. We're going to have bonus perpetual chess coverage um, starting November 29th on every rest day. I'll be attempting to track down people in Dubai and interview them, and I'll have coverage either way, talking about the matches and get, hopefully getting some uh, boots-on-the-ground reports on every rest day. We will also still have our regular content, interviews coming out on, on Tuesdays. We've got a book recap of my first book of Morphe coming around December 1st. Of course, in the regular content, we won't be discussing the ongoing match, but other than that, it will be... Uh, business as usual. Uh, so with those announcements out of the way, let's introduce our guest. Uh, he is the writer of the Indispensable Chess blog and Twitter account, Chess by the Numbers. As I mentioned in part one of the World Championship Preview with Daniel King, uh, Daniel is like the perfect person to discuss the human element of the match, having been analyzing all their games and with his experience as a top-level chess player and the fact that he's been reviewing uh, their games on his YouTube channel. So obviously, if you guys haven't checked out Daniel's content and heard our interview, I encourage you to do that. But now we're going to dig into the numbers, and we're joined by Ty Proust Zimmerman, who is a stay-at-home dad, joining us from his home in Oregon. He previously worked as an accountant, so well-trained in statistics. He's also a chess enthusiast and aspiring adult improver, and he writes on his blog in his about page for most of my life i've been obsessed with both statistics and with chess in recent years i've spent a lot of time combining these two fascinations and analyzing chess statistics in a variety of ways this blog is the result so i'll be checking in all the time as i always do to ty's blog during the match um, but first we're excited to get a numerical and analytical preview of the world championship and let's welcome ty to the show ty how are you i'm doing really good thank you yeah, excited to have you. Excited for the match. It's finally happening. You've been running your numbers, working on the preview. So uh, I want to dive right into sort of the top line of what your model says. But just uh, a couple things. Um, I went through some of the broadcast teams and stuff prior to my interview with Daniel, but just wanted to make sure all listeners are aware of the format for the World Championship. Um, the first thing to know, I think most people do know, it's 14 slow games. And if someone has um, a plus score after the 14 games, the match is over. So it could conceivably even be clinched before the 14 games are up. Now, of course, if the score is equal after the 14 games, they go to a four-game mini-match of rapid games. And if someone has a plus score in the rapid games, the match is over. But what I actually didn't even realize until these past few days is after those four rapid games, if it's tied, which according to my crunching of Ty's math, there's like a 3% chance that could happen, which is not zero, um, then they would go to five mini blitz matches, five best of two blitz matches, which would just be absolute insanity if that happens, if that's how the world championship is decided. Um, editorially speaking, um, I'm a, obviously I've been a proponent of uh, faster tie breaks when necessary, but I think they could throw in a couple more rapid games before going to blitz to decide the world championship personally. But in any event, just wanted to make sure listeners were aware of that. And if they're tied after the five blitz mini matches, which uh, Ty has assured me is an extremely low probability outcome, um, then they would go to an Armageddon game, which would just be uh, off the hook, totally nuts. So we wanted to make sure you guys all knew that that's what we're going to be discussing. Um, so Ty, uh, let's actually dig in before you share the results of your uh, analytic model of uh, what what is most probable in this match. Let's actually start with a Patreon question from friend of the pod, Han Shu, uh, adult improver, chess blogger over on chess.com. 
Pin. Han asked an apropos question to start with, which is thank you for all your probability calculations. Um, and he has two questions, but we're just going to do one of them now, which is what goes into your model other than live ratings, if anything? For instance, do you use the mutual score between two players in your calculations? And he no notes that it could be fur further refined by weighing the most recent results uh, rather than uh, as opposed to like when they were 12 and 14. So take it away, Ty. Yeah. So first of all, I don't use the exact same model for every tournament that I look at. So if we're asking specifically what goes into the world championship model that I'm going to be talking about today, more goes into this than is than normal. Um, I'm willing on a lot of my other tournaments that I cover to keep things a little bit rougher of an estimation and use fewer sources and just the goal is to give close enough numbers that it can give some context for the match. But for something as important as the world championship, I took a lot of extra time to dig down and use a lot more. And I'll get into some details on that in a minute. But as far as head to head, that I actually didn't use at all. Um, like you said, a lot of the games that these two players have played against each other that are on that record happened when they were 12 or 14. And I think that what Magnus did in any game this year is infinitely more predictive than what he did in any game when he was 12, even if his opponent was a 12 year old Nepo. So I didn't pay any attention to the direct head-to-head -head match. It's just not a big enough sample size uh, because only recent head-to-head -head games, I think, would mean anything. And I'm not going to predict off of two or three games. So I'm always looking for a bigger sample size to drive it. So I definitely use as my base the ELO ratings. And then for this match, I did some drilling down on how well ELO ratings actually do predict world championship matches historically. And I did look at recent performances, uh, not just against each other, but overall. And so I made adjustments for those factors to get to a pro projected rating difference that I think represents the actual difference in playing strength that we're likely to see in this match in the context of a world championship. Yeah, I, I already have so many uh, so many follow ups. I find this stuff fascinating. And um, as I was discussing with Daniel King, part of the the trick is, uh, you know, you don't know how much to weight these things. I mean, all you can do at the end of the day is make an educated guess. But as we were saying, like Nepo has been performing more strongly recently um, and it's a little tricky to know. Do you just uh, as when I talked about with uh with Dr. Mark Glipman, I mean, the the ELO format is like all the games you've ever played, which maybe doesn't isn't you know, the perfect way to represent someone's current playing strength. Um, but in any event, before we get into all the sort of follow up and nitty gritty details that, that I love, we should probably start with the top line, Ty. So what is the top line? What is the probability that when it's all said and done, including tie breaks, if necessary, what is the probability that, that Magnus wins the match as compared to Nepo? Uh, so I, have, to your model. I have Magnus in my model at 81.5% to retain the title and Nepo then at 18 and a half percent. Okay. Yeah. Which is, you know, given again, given what all I've, all the recent interviews with all these chess luminaries I've had people from Kramnik to Soltis uh, touting Nepo's, uh, you know, maybe even chances are better of winning um, Daniel King coming in in sort of 60, 40 range. It might be surprising to hear that, but, you know, the, the ELO system for all of its flaws <laughs> tends to be pretty accurate. And uh, as, as Magnus said, uh, his, his uh, you know, quoted him with Daniel King as well, his, his biggest edge is he's, be he's better at chess over a, a long sample. So I we're, love when you said surprised. that because yeah, that was, I, love, I mean, that had been the driving basis of all of my analysis is at the end of the day, he's better at chess. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of incentive to say if you're not having to really put serious numbers on it to say, yeah, probably 60-40. I think it's going to be close. It's great to hype the match. And I do, as a fan, hope that it is a close match. But the, Magnus is a much better chess player. There's a lot of evidence for that. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, again, the only sort of countervailing evidence is if you narrow the window and look at uh, games within the past two years, but these are fully formed grown men. It's, it, you know, it's rare at the age. Now, Nepo, you know, you can always apply a narrative. You know, Nepo, there's the, there's the narrative that he didn't take chess seriously. And obviously he has, um, you know, uh, shown greater performance in, in recent years, but still, I mean, it's it's hard not to look at the larger sample when you're trying to to predict. And I wanted to give a shout out to a friend of the pod, FM Nate Solon, who uh, helped me recap Zurich 1953 on his Substack Zwish and Zug, which you guys should all be subscribed to. He had a piece out this morning also, and he's also got a sort of a analytical background. And Nate was just pointing out that like a lot of the sort of inside the experts of chess who are from within the chess ecosystem. He referenced uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, where he refers to sort of the inside view. So these people, it's almost like they know too much, you know? Um, so they're they're looking at all the games, but the outside view, as Nate alluded to, is just like, who's higher rated and what's likely to happen based on that? Um, so again, and that doesn't mean, you know, Ty's model may be wrong if Nepo wins, but we would never know. You know, there's no way to, when you live in a probabilistic world, there's no way to know was the model wrong. Now, if Nepo wins by like going away, that might be a bit of a red flag. But other than that, there's um, just, just no way to know. Now, um, Ty, so I know you've got a lot more details than just the top line. So what else could we share? Like, for example, um, I don't know in what order we want to tackle these, but like, what are the odds that it goes to a rapid tie break? Yeah, so uh, I, I'll answer that and then double back to top lines for a second. But the a rapid tie break, I have a 15% chance. So it's Magnus wins in classical a little over 70% of the time. Nepo wins just over 14% of the time, and the remaining 15% of scenarios take us into the rapid. Okay. And then you did note that Magnus is a smaller favorite in the rapid than than in the overall match. Um, what was it, 58%, I think, to win? It, if it goes to rapid, the odds in that specific phase, I have Magnus... J- at 52.6% to win with Nepo at 20% and a 27% of going on to blitz. Right. Which is an uh, artifact with- not of their gap being smaller. In fact, I have their gap being larger if it goes to rapid. It's an artifact of it being a four game match instead of 14. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. And you said you wanted to double back to some more top line data to share? Yeah. And it speaks to that point of how many of the number of games being a big deal. A big part of the reason why, as a ratings favorite, Magnus is a relatively strong favorite in the match is that it's a 14-game match. If it was four games, like the rapid portion is, there's a lot of room for randomness, and the weaker player by rating can still have a good result in one game that can churn the match. But over the course of 14, it actually smooths out quite a bit. So I just wanted to give an example of different rating differentials and what odds they would produce. Uh, And so I have three numbers I'm going to give. My model that puts us at 81.5% for Magnus to win assumes when all is said and done that the playing strength difference in this match is going to be 40 ELO points. Um, For anyone saying that the difference is that the odds are 60-40, they're suggesting that the playing strength differential is 10. A player who's hmm. 10 points better would be a 60-40 favorite in a 14-game match. That's fascinating. And I love the way that you approached it backwards, you know, that 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 you sort of um started with the conclusion and then went back to the to what the what the supposition would be. Because yeah, I, I don't think. I feel like if you polled these people and you ask them, you know, is Magnus 10 points stronger than Nepo or more, you know, for the <laughs> most part, they're, they're, they're going to say more. Um, so I, I might be, um, you know, I might be revealing my bias just a little bit in the way that I'm discussing this. But my overall, I mean, I don't consider, you know, I, obviously I have tons of respect for all these luminaries of the chess world that I've gotten to interview. I don't consider my opinion to be like uh, 
especially valid, but I I do tend to come down on the more bullish Magnus uh, side of things relative to the people that I have interviewed. And just for for the record, 2700chess.com, the current live ratings are 2855.9 for Magnus. And Nepo at number five is 2782. So you could argue that uh, that Ty's model is even conservative. Um, did you run the, one? And that was the third top line I was going to give here. Yeah. If you think the playing strength difference in the actual match format is 74 points, like the actual rating list says, then Magnus would be a 94% favorite to win. Yeah, and it's all very reminiscent of the election things, like election forecasts, where, like, you know, obviously Nate Silver being the most prominent, um, air quotes, pundit, and uh, he he always gets dragged over the coals anytime his model is like, you know, super bullish on. I mean, it feels like he can't win no matter no matter what he does, but. Um, that's neither here nor there. But yeah, the numbers can be shocking. You know, it's a it's a little um, counterintuitive. But as you say, 14 games is a, is a lot of games. So there's a lot of time for the, the cream to, to rise to the top. Um, so what else? What else do we need to know? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess that sort of gets to what what did I do to try to estimate the playing strength? Because it did require some judgment calls, which drives me drives me batty. I would I hate to have to use judgment when I'm trying to be as objective as possible in an analysis. But there's like I said, if we just plugged in the 74 point rating difference to the model and said, let's see what happens, Magnus comes out at 94%. And while I do think Magnus is the better player, I do think he's the favorite, that just doesn't quite pass the smell test. And so I had to try to figure out in the context of a match where the players have had months to prepare for each other individually. And generally speaking, both players will show up at a higher level than they would at some normal tournament. Uh, What does that do to a rating differential? And so I looked back at, so I did, I did two adjustments. One was to look at how they've played over the course of the year or I I went back to uh, October, 2020, sort of when chess started back up after the pandemic and checked their performance ratings, which had just a smaller gap between them. Um, Nepo's performance rating in was 2779, Magnus 2837. So that just shrunk the gap a little and I, again, judgment had to come into play. I didn't want to use only the performance ratings, which are too small of a sample size, but I also didn't want to just use the ELO ratings, which are a lifetime's body of work, like we've said, for better and for worse. It includes a lot of old, stale data, but it also is a bigger sample. So I just split the difference. I averaged those two numbers. And that brought the gap from 74 down to 66. So that okay. was the first adjustment I made to justify a reason why. Okay. And I also wanted to share, I alluded to this in our interview with Daniel King, but but what the betting markets say, um, you know, some people might argue that that's sort of the, the air quote, most efficient, um, uh, you know, um, probabilistic estimation because anyone who really feels strongly about this can can put money to work behind it of course here in the united states that's not as easy as uh, <laughs> as it, as it is in some other places um but pinnacle sports which is one of the biggest sports books in the world um they have magnus at minus thir- 337 and nepo at plus 262 so what that means is if you were going to bet on magnus you would need to whisk, risk $337 to win 100 and if you were going to bet on nepo you would have to risk $100 to win 262 or to put that in uh, plain English if you strip out the the vig the money that um, the money that the sports books uh, take for themselves uh, it uh, correlates to basically a 74 to 26 percent uh, probability in in Magnus's favor and that of course again in, includes the scenarios where it goes to rapid blitz or God forbid Armageddon um, so Comes down fairly similarly to Ty's model, but if you were going to blindly bet it, you would take Magnus. And again, like, you know, Jonathan Levitt, who was on the show and is a professional better, um, 
he he was a professional cricket better, but obviously that means that he knows probabilities quite well. He he recently said on Facebook, like I I would love to bet Magnus, but the price just stings. You know, it's just hard to pull the trigger, and I think uh, a a lot of people feel feel that way. Even those, it's it's hard to lay four to one uh, when you have these two elite players uh, playing, or three to one in in Pinnacle's case. But um, anyway, fascinating stuff. And you also had the data on it, so. We've talked about if it goes to um, rapid tie break, and if it goes to blitz tie break tie, um, then how do the odds shake out? So if it goes to blitz tie breaks, um, first of all, on any pair of games, since it's done in pairs, they play two games, and if they break the tie, they break it. If not, they play another pair. So in one pair of games, I have Magnus at 50% to win, Nepo at just under 19% and a 31% chance of 1-1 and going to the next pair. Okay. Wow. That's more, that's a bigger gap than I would have expected. That's based on uh, blitz ratings? Uh, slightly. Um, I actually didn't give Magnus his full 100-point edge that he has in the blitz ratings. Uh, generally speaking, I've found that the best predictor of both rapid and blitz results is actually classical ratings. Um, classical ratings are just based on better samples overall. And if you're trying the rapid and blitz ratings fluctuate just enough and are, there's just few enough tournaments out there, there's, it's still relatively new that FIDE even tracks those as official ratings. Uh, I found this out, especially when I was building a model to, try to create a rating system for the uh, champions chess tour. And I tried to seed it with players rapid ratings initially. And then I also tried seeding with their classical ratings. And I found out that when I put their rapid ratings in to start, everyone's ratings changed dramatically when they started playing games. But if I started at their classical rating, a lot of them were pretty stable. So I've determined that the best way to predict rapid and blitz is to look at a classical rating, even though it's even though it's fun to track the rapid and blitz ratings. They're less predictive. Yeah, I mean, in Magnus's case, you can just input Dr. Nickerstein's uh, 3200 Lee Chess (laughs) rating hot off the presses. He's playing every day, you know, (laughs) but 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 yeah, no, no such luck with Nepo. So um, if if Nepo's playing, it's a secret account. So, (laughs) (laughs) But what I did do Um, is I erased a lot of the adjustments that had brought the match closer. I think that. Uh, the true that the rating differential of that full 74 points, I think that that differential is more likely to come into play as time controls get faster. I think the evening, the rating compression and the evening of the score that happens around months of preparation for classical chess starts to gradually disappear as the games get faster. So for the blitz portion, I assumed I actually split the difference a little. I took the 74 rate point classical edge and the 100 point blitz edge, and I called it plus 80 is Magnus's rating edge if it goes to blitz in my formulas. Okay. And was there, when you talk about the evening of of, uh, performance that can take place uh, because it's a long match, is that based on historical... um, like obviously Magnus has underperformed his ELO, even though he only had a small ELO edge against Caruana. So I guess that one being tied was was not a, a statistical outlier. But against Karyak, and that would have been a fairly low probability outcome for them to go to tie breaks. Is it based on historical data or yes. just based on sort of okay? Um and um I have to give a shout out to the Smarter Chess article on chess.com for the inspiration to take a closer look at that. Because uh, that was a really good, another really good statistical match preview that I read. And it pointed out, first of all, it looked at it from the perspective of uh, the defending champion, who has on average been a ratings favorite in, in historical matches. Under, and the defending champions did not perform quite as well as their rating says. So I went through and did my own analysis where I just, regardless of who already had the title i just looked at how did the rating favorite do and did they live up to their rating or not and historically 
the rating favorite tends to underperform their rating by about 30 to 35 rating points. Okay. Um, yeah. Interesting. And of course- Carlson has been better than the historical average. Uh, that, when I say 30 to 35, that includes Carlson's matches. But the average when it's someone other than Magnus going back through back through to the 80s is really closer to 40 points. And Magnus has only underperformed his rating by 19 points across his four matches. Um, the Karyakin one was a big underperformance. He was 81 points stronger officially. And of course they tied. So that was an underperformance of 81 points. But against Caruana, he underperformed by three. Against Anon, the second time, he only underperformed by six. And he actually overperformed his rating in the first match against Anand. He was favored by 95 points, but he scored 65%, which was the equivalent of a 110-point edge. So he overperformed by 15 in that match. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, yeah, I wanted to echo your shout out to uh, Matt Jensen of Chess Goals, Smarter Chess on Chess.com. I've got a few more nuggets that I pulled from that article as well. And it was funny that like... I, I had reached out to you in anticipation of this interview and was like, hey, just wanted to let you know I'll be referencing a few things from this article. And you were like, well, so will I. So uh, so shout out to Matt. And we'll, we'll get back to the numbers in a minute. But first, um, in a minute, we're going to take a break. And I'm going to reveal a quote from uh, Grandmaster Jakob Agard about what he expects in the match. Um, I, uh, I'll explain why <laughs> in a minute. But uh, fun, fun, fun input from a uh, friend of the pod, Jakob Agard, forthcoming after this break. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our old friends at Chessable.com. Hopefully you know by now about their proprietary move trainer technology that helps you remember tactical patterns as well as opening sequences. Whatever aspect of your game you're looking to work on, there is an excellent chance that Chessable has something for you to help. They're also constantly releasing new courses. In the pipeline currently, they've got a lifetime repertoire 1E4 from none other than Anish Giri. And they've got the Ginger GM, Simon Williams, soon to release a treatment of legendary Grandmaster Alexei Shiro's Fire on Board, plus so much more. So just be sure to always go to chessable.com and take a look at what's new. Good news, listeners. According to aimchess.com, I'm now only behind on the clock 75% of the time in my Blitz games. That's actually huge progress for me. I'm going to keep working to bring it up, and I recommend you use aimchess.com to address whatever weaknesses you may have in your game, whether it be playing with the white or black pieces, a particular opening, or a particular phase of the game. They give tailored lessons for whatever their algorithm detects, and of course, their algorithm scrapes the games from the major chess player sites themselves in order to tell you what you need. If you decide to subscribe to aimchess.com after checking it out, be sure to use the promo code perpetual30. Details are in the show notes. Check out aimchess.com. Okay, and we are back. And major shout out to a longtime friend of the pod, supporter of the pod, Peter Newhall, who pulled a major flex and submitted a question for a guest who... Was not on the show. I had no announcement that he's coming. I had not been in touch with him. And Peter just said, you know, that's all fine and, and dandy, Ben, that you're having Daniel King on to talk about the World Chess Championship. But I have a question for Jakob Agard. Um, <laughs> I was so uh, so floored by Peter's chutzpah that I actually felt like I had to get it answered. So Patreon subs, don't make a habit of this. I will not just start chasing down random questions for other grandmasters that are not on the show. But for Peter, I made a special exception. And I did not get Jakob on the show, but I did email him and get a quote um, of what he expects from the match. So Peter, first of all, let me read Peter's quote, um, which was, um, which was, um, how does Jakob assess the match? Yes, I realize there's no Agard announced. However, given he has had by far the most accurate finals predictions over the last couple of matches, and in my opinion, has given the best actual insights into what he thinks is going on with the players, I think you need to get him on for five to ten minutes in some manner to talk about the matchup. And Jakob, of course, uh, esteemed author and chess trainer. He's the uh, lead coach of Grandmaster Sam Shanklin and has a uh, killer chess training, which is a great training site that you could hear uh, John. Hartman 
um, discuss uh, in our recent interview. So shout out to Jakob. Thank you for indulging us. And here is what Jakob said. He said, I believe Carlson will retain the world championship in less than 14 games, most likely 13. Napomnici has won against Carlson in situations where Carlson overpressed, but Carlson has no reason to do so here. Also, seeing Napomnici win games the way he won in candidates, I find unlikely. The level is much higher in the match. Most importantly, Napomnici always finishes badly. He wears out. He has lost weight and probably gained stamina, but it may not be enough this time. Carlson does have weaknesses. He loses focus and can be arrogant, but he has matured a lot and seems much wiser than he was. He no longer believes it is a divine right for him to win. In 2014, he lost a game where he did not review his files. In 2018, he mixed up the move order. I do believe that his biggest weakness is straight out of the opening. On the other hand, the playoff is perhaps less of a trump for Carlson this time around. So there you have his quote. And actually, I was struck. Um, I got that quote from Carl from uh, Jakob Agard about a week ago. And just yesterday, uh, Carlson did a podcast interview in Norwegian that uh, Targay Svensson was nice enough to write up for Chess24.com. Um, yet another must read in the relentless torrent of uh, must consume chess preview, world chess championship preview content. But Carlson's comments actually I felt like greatly echoed what um what Agard said I mean Carlson you know he's he he never minces words he always says says what he thinks and he actually mentioned um in that interview that he felt like the fact that the candidates was split into two matches um into two halves rather favored uh helped Nepo because Nepo was coming off a loss to MVL at the end of the first half and then had a year to recover. And Carlson said, historically, he hasn't recovered that well from matches. And Carlson actually had a few comments where he basically made it sound like he's going to try to push hard in the early rounds, which uh, gets to the conversation I had with Daniel King about sort of there being a potential adjustment period to sort of the the bright lights of uh, the biggest stage. So um, anyway, shout out again to Jakob. Uh, do you have any uh, reaction to, to his uh, assessment time? I think it sounds spot on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I can't necessarily speak as well to some of the actual like assessment of the players themselves. I don't have the ability to analyze how people play chess at that level. That's why I rely on the numbers. But I think it, everything in that quote felt like it lined up really well with the story that I see my numbers telling as well. So it sounded excellent. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And we've got a few more um, Patreon questions to dig into. Um, um, if you need, I, I had sent this to you in advance, but if you need a minute to dig it out, let me know and we can come back to it. But Alex Friedman asked uh, somewhat playfully, I would think, but he says, we're used to mostly draws in these uh, uh, matches, but what are the odds of Magnus adopting Ian, which would mean winning 10 in a row, of course. Well, the boring answer, sadly, is it's impossible because the match would end before that we got there. Uh, <laughs> 10 in a row would take you well past the seven and a half you need to clinch, but I ran the numbers anyway. Uh, the odds of 10 wins in a row in classical, according to my model, is 23.35 million to one. Okay. Where do I sign up? I want to put a dollar down on that. <laughs> although as you, <laughs> although as you say, um, <laughs> as you say, the fact that the match would be ended, although I actually don't, don't, I have, this is one format question I should have chased down. Do you happen to know, Ty, if, if Magnus clinches, is the match over or do they go through the motions on the remaining games? Um, I haven't, seen a completely explicit answer to that anywhere but i assume that it ends every other i've ne they've ne there's never been a chess world championship i'm aware of where someone clinched and they kept playing and i don't think oh, that yeah. would start now so I, okay. I i didn't i didn't see that in the regulations specifically but i didn't look too closely for it i'm assuming that first to seven and a half will end it um and I will yeah. also add that that twenty three point that twenty three million to one that's in any given set of ten games uh, because it's impossible in the match format. I didn't break down like what are the odds would be a little better if you played twenty games and only had to win ten in a row at some point than of winning. But it's unlikely enough that I didn't dig any further than that. I hope that yeah. I hope twenty three million to one is a sufficient answer. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think it is. Again, I just <laughs> just wish I could bet on it, just in case. Um, okay, I put um, dollar down wanna, too. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, I wanted to share some data. Aim Chess uh, recently on Twitter did, you know, they ran their algorithm based on the different aspects of the games. Um, so just to share some more data, they uh, they looked at the last 400 classical games of each player and then uh, did their thing. They uh, assessed um, assessed the strengths and weaknesses um, of, of each player um, relative to their, of course, rating peers. So um, number one is opening preparation, which... Um, I understand is measured by looking at how often they get an advantage with white or how often they equalize with black. And both players got 99% from aim chess's algorithm for that. Uh, number two was advantage capital capitalization. Um, when you do have an advantage, how often do you win? Uh, Magnus got 89% and uh, Nepo got 88%. So actually that's, that one is a little closer than I might've guessed. Um, Number three is resourcefulness. Um, this is coming back from a position where you're behind, um, according to the engine. And in this, Magnus got 37% and Nepo got 30%. Number four is straight up accuracy, just how good are their moves compared to the top engine choice. Um, Magnus got 96% and Nepo got 93%. And last but not least, endgame. And this, somewhat un unsurprisingly, I would say, is where you see the starkest difference. Um, Magnus got 80% uh, and Nepo got 63%. So I'll link to the graphic uh, where that is shown, but I found that to be uh, pretty interesting as well. And it does, again, anytime you parse, this, this, anytime you steer away from sort of a um, anecdote-driven narrative, uh, it's gonna gonna favor the, the player who's been stronger over uh, um, a long period of time. Um, so was there anything else? I feel like I had a few other quotes from, from Matt Jensen's article. Um, number one, we, we discussed the fact that Matt actually looked at what is more predictive, um, when it, whether it's more predictive to look at, uh, ELO or to look at prior results. And, uh, of course it came across, uh, ELO. He had a fun fact about, uh, just looking at the historically the type of person that's most likely to topple the current world championship. And Matt actually uh, concluded with this. He In the past 17 world championship matches, only three times the challenger won the crown, and they were at least 12 years younger than the champion each time. So can you think of any strong players 12 years younger than Magnus, <laughs> Ty? Anyone who's uh, been making news lately? <laughs> gee, who could there be in that range? Yeah. Um, I, I might be switching back and forth between a tab with Faruja Mamedyarov uh, <laughs> as we interview right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big um, game. Yeah, so Faruja has been on an absolute tear, obviously, and uh, yeah, up to I believe it's number three in the live rankings. So, yeah, I mean that's one other potential subplot with him having qualified for the candidates is he is uh looming in the on deck circle potentially although not if i mean to to go on history often even with these like you know young phenoms like i mean Faruja's is on a trajectory where basically the only historical comps are like uh Kasparov, Carlson, and Fisher in terms of uh, <laughs> what he's achieved by the age of 18. But even in those cases, often they they lose one candidate before they're able to break through. So even though it seems like Faruja is some sort of uh, statistical inevitability in terms of challenging for the world championship, uh, it may not happen in the next cycle, and it may never happen. You you mm -hmm. you never know. Um, so we do have one more Patreon question well, from I wanna, Peter Newho. I want to yeah, go ahead. At jump in on that because just there's a reason why of course that in the probabilities a canis turn is really hard to win even if you're the best player there um you got eight point, yeah you get eight great players if everyone had equal odds each player would be at 12 and a half percent with eight with eight with an eight player field so even if you're the best player in the field and even if you've got better odds than the rest that usually isn't going to get you higher than 20 maybe 25 percent if you're like much better so you're any given player even the favorite is still an underdog to the field in the candidates so it's it's just a really hard tournament to win so yeah we, you can't count on someone winning it the first time they get there no matter what trajectory they're on but also it's feeling really 
hard to bet against Faruja doing anything right now. So, <laughs> so that, <laughs> yeah, that's a very it's... fun subplot for the future. But also we've got a world championship match coming up in a few days. So resolve that first. Yeah. And it, yeah, I mean, it is fun to think about because I mean, it could really light a fire if Magnus is the champion or Nepo. Um, well, I mean, it could really yeah, 18, light a f- you want to talk about that candidates match 18 and a half percent of the time. Faruja and Magnus will be fighting each other in the candidates. <laughs> That's with with current ratings. Uh, the, I, oh, the, oh, oh, yeah. The 18 and a half that I gave Nepo loses. To win. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that. Yeah, I'd like to see them in a longer match, personally. <laughs> but, uh, I'd rather see the match, but but, <laughs> but Nepo, if you're listening, I I got love for you too. It's nothing. It's nothing personal. <laughs> I just uh, as a sports fan, you know, I feel like in terms of like sports fandom, there's the people who gravitate towards the underdog and there's the people who gravitate towards liking dominance um like liking to see the perennial champion like just uh continue to to play at a higher level and my sort of uh inclinations uh, like beyond the chess world are i just i just like seeing dominance more than uh the underdog narrative so um but uh nepo higher at your holler at your boy i'm still uh still would be the honor of a lifetime to interview you win or lose and it's uh Nothing personal um, whatsoever. Um, so we're going to take one more break, Ty, and then we've got one more Patreon mailbag question from uh, Peter Newhall. Excellent. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood was founded in 2018 by Grandmaster Avtik Gregorian. It's a chess education platform that gives you a structured path to work to improve your chess. For $29 a month, you get instant access to over 200 hours of Grandmaster prepared video content and includes openings, middle games, and end games. They also have an active online community where you can find training partners and fellow chess enthusiasts. Uh, Don't forget to check out their free content. They have a great blog where their grandmasters share uh, their own thoughts on chess improvement. I get it delivered to my inbox. So to learn more about uh, Chess Mood and what they offer, be sure to check out their website, chessmood.com. And we are back. So Ty, the remaining question from Peter, uh, Peter, like uh, myself, is a big fan of your blog. And he actually mentioned that you used to uh, poke around on the two plus two poker forums, which was really a, a world's collide moment, because I did not realize that even as a, a former poker pro. But anyway, Peter uh, mentioned, he said, with the recent addition your website has been getting, is there any chance of a sponsorship deal? For instance, could the Magnus Group incorporate your data and website as a regular part of their broadcast? His reasons are purely selfish. He'd love to see the Prodigy Watch updated regularly, which we'll get to. Uh, How do you deal with draw rate and variables like that when running simulations? Uh, Do you look at, we've covered some of this, do you look at similar past events or players' history against each other? Do you run simulations? simulations with different draw rates to see how it affects overall percentages. Um, and that's the extent of his questions. So just any ones that you haven't addressed, especially about a sponsorship deal. Yeah. So as far as a sponsorship deal, my email is chessnumbers <laughs> at gmail.com. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I can also be reached through easily through Twitter direct messages. Um, if yes. I, I, I won't give you my phone number on air, but you know, if anyone <laughs> right, wants you, it. Yeah, it's gettable. <laughs> Uh, well, let's start with the Patreon page because I did, you know, I've donated to your website and I'm uh, with your permission. I'd like to share some more data from the match and I'll be donating uh, again. But any any chance of setting up a, a Patreon page? I know in the early days of Perpetual Chess, it was helpful to have uh, recurring revenue rather than mm-hmm. um, than random donations. So I guess the serious answer is that um, I've never put any real thought into trying to monetize what I do on the blog so far. Uh, I did, when I relaunched it this year, I did set up a a PayPal link so that people who really feel compelled to contribute can. Um, But for me, it's just been, these are questions that I as a chess fan had that I couldn't find answers to anywhere else. Uh, it's I like that you mentioned the two plus two forums. I'm actually technically still a moderator of the chess sub forum over there, and that's where this blog began. Um, just talking in a chess forum online with people about events that were coming up. I had questions like, "What are the odds of different players winning? Uh, how impressive is this 16 year old's rating 
actually at his age compared to his historical fact? And I couldn't find answers to a lot of those questions I had. So I started building spreadsheets because that's what I do when I have questions. And then I started posting the answers I found in the forum. And people told me that it was interesting and that they wanted me to post more about it. And from there, I eventually launched the blog to put it out there for a wider audience. So all of this, it's very much in that labor of love category where it's when I have a question, when I have something interesting that I don't I, that I don't see an answer to elsewhere, I'll go try to find an answer. And then whatever I find, I'm happy to share with my audience. So I haven't tried that hard to do any monetization type things. But also, that leaves me with less doing a little bit less work. And I appreciate uh, Peter's selfish desire to see more of it. And if it was something that I was doing because of a regular uh, sponsorship option or for Patreon subscribers or something like that, it would definitely be a good push for me to publish more regularly, which I would like to do. So I'd be definitely interested in going in that direction. Um, the Patreon page, it might be an option. I hadn't really thought too much about that. It doesn't, it didn't feel to me ever like a blog fits the Patreon format so well. But I'd be intrigued. Um, I like that uh, Peter in that question also mentions being a regular on broadcasts. I did get a chance to do a little guest spot on the uh, Champions Chess Tour broadcast in the final day of prelims for the uh, AIM Chess Rapid, uh, the ninth tournament in that tour, and talk about the odds of who would qualify as it went, which was a whole lot of fun. And the idea of being on broadcast really fits with what I'm always trying to do with my blog. My overarching goal above all else is just to give chess fans background and context that can make chess more fun to watch. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and you're doing a great job. Yeah. I feel like understanding as much as possible about which games are the most important in a big tournament, where what's at stake, where how much the odds will shift with a win or a loss uh, who has the chances to qualify. The more about that that I think you know going into a, the last round of a big event or whatever, the more you can focus your attention and hopefully enjoy enjoy watching top-level chess more. So that's always what I'm trying to work on. And so anything I can... And I definitely think that fits really well with a broadcast, which is theoretically trying to. So certainly any broadcasters out there who want to use my numbers or want to work with me to do something specific for in it, for the format, I'd be very, very interested in uh, getting involved in something like that. There was a, before I, before I uh, majored in accounting, there was a brief chunk of my uh, education where I declared myself as a journalism major. And I did plan on going into the statistics side of sports journalism with it. And I always envisioned myself back then, not as like an ESPN anchor, but as the guy in the van that they get their numbers from. Right. Yeah. And I would, <laughs> and now I've ended, I left that behind, majored in accounting instead, moved on, but now I've got a chess blog and I would love to be that same in that same role for any major chess broadcast. And I think I could bring a lot of value to it. So I would certainly I, welcome a call on that topic. Yeah, I agree. And just just to be clear, I mean, Ty, what he's doing, like what we've discussed with the World Championship, um, I I do find his data super valuable, but um, I, he's not the only one that I've seen. Um, the aforementioned Matt Jensen of Chess Coles had a great write-up. And New in Chess, by the way, uh, just dropped a, a free preview uh, uh, digital magazine Um where they had like Jan Timmen writing about the match and Dirk Jantan Guzendam and uh, Max Dlugi wrote about what would happen if there's a rapid playoff. So there's just, so, and in that they had, they used an analytics model to talk about uh, this is, this is what the model says. And again, and the model of course, like Matt's did and like yours did comes out uh, more bullish Magnus than the anecdotes that we tend to gather. But anyway, that's just a long way of saying that 
the data is reasonably well covered for something like the world championship, but a lot of the stuff that Ty's doing is not well covered. There's just like, you know, the, the day to day, like, uh, uh, weekend Z and uh, the Champions Chess Tour and and so on and and ties there grinding for for every tournament share, sharing uh, his his analytics and it's a welcome addition and uh, Ty uh, you can subscribe to his blog and I actually you know I follow him on Twitter and we're both extremely online so I didn't really need to get his his uh, posts emailed to me but there are some blogs that I enjoy where uh, if they're not online as much um, then. I find it hard to actually remember to read it. So like, like I enjoy uh, Dennis Monacruz's the chess mind blog, but you can't even get it emailed to you. So sometimes it's, it'll be like months in between visits just because I forget. So shout out. So anyone interested in checking out Ty's content, all you have to do is go to the, go to his webpage and, uh, and submit your, your email address. Um, so I think we've got the world championship covered, right? Ty, was there anything you wanted to share before? Like, is there anything that you expected to share that I, we haven't covered yet? Um, I don't think there was too much. Um, I mean, the main, the actual model is pretty straightforward. Um, I will say just in, if people are wondering a little bit about methodology, I will mention that this is that I do not have a Monte Carlo simulation for this one. I actually built it out a hundred percent probabilistic, so it looks at every. Could you, ex- could you explain that? In yes. Layman's so, terms. Yeah, absolutely. So the go-to way to simulate complex events like a chess tournament with a bunch of players, and what I normally use in most of my modeling is called a Monte Carlo simulation, where you just randomly generate results for the event, mark down the results of that simulation. And then you do it again and again and again. Uh, obviously, a computer does it. <laughs> and you simulate the tournament a whole bunch of times, and you just see what the odds are of different results happening across all those simulations. Uh, in each simulation, one person wins. And across a million simulations, you get a percentage of how often each person could win. Uh, and they're not quite, I mean, they, they get pretty close to really reflecting the reality of the numbers if you do enough simulations and for a really complex event they're the only option but the world championship is straightforward enough with just 14 games between two players that i was able instead to actually make it a hundred percent probability based where every single combination of 14 games to the third power i was able to map out in a spreadsheet so all I have to do is change one cell with what the with a different rating differential or a different assumption about draw rates, and it can immediately calculate the odds. So the odds that I've got here are 100% probability-based, not based off the simulation like I normally do, which is why I was able so easily to say... Here's what ten. Here's what it would be if you had a ten elo difference. Here's what it would be at seventy four. That piece. So that was a model methodology that I had figured we'd probably check in on a little. Uh, for the good to have it here at the end for the real nerds that stuck it out. <laughs> yeah, and 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 speaking of of the real nerds, like you know, in terms of like building a probabilistic model, they always talk about sort of like updating your priors. You know, as mm-hmm. new data comes in, you need a way to sort of incorporate it. Um, is there anything that could happen in the early games of the match that would make you like question the assumptions and like? change the inputs or would it just be like okay nepo won the first game but i'm still using the same data you know to to predict what would happen uh here on out i mean the model assumes that nepo has a chance to win games so if at at this point uh i i'm locked in on the model and if nepo wins a game i'm gonna assume it's because he had a chance to win a game uh there's actually something i never mentioned the actual odds of an individual game I do have those, um, and w- it does touch on one piece of my methodology, which is that I do account for color. That was actually, I yeah, think, which part I believe Han asked Han's about. Yeah, question. and so m- my model, all of my models assumptions that came out to the eighty-one and a half percent are on a baseline that when Magnus is white. I have him winning the game 28% of the time, losing 8% with a 64% draw rate. 
And when Magnus is black, I have him winning with black 12%, losing 10% with a 78% draw rate. Okay. Yeah, and uh, shout out to uh, JJ Lang, Chess Fields on Twitter, a Dalton Prover who's been on the show. He tweeted out, like I think it was yesterday, just uh, for newer chess fans, again, the hardcore who are still listening, he he did want to just warn people to be ready for draws. You know, there's like, we all we all have this huge anticipation for the match that we've been obviously talking about on the podcast, uh, ad nauseum, some might say. Um, and I'm super excited as well, but there's, you know, it's... Um, it's a psychological battle. It's a, you know, and there's a lot of draws in chess to begin with. So it's possible you might see like, you know, one of the players just offer a draw as white on the 22nd move or something early in the match. And just cause they got an opening, they didn't feel that comfortable with or something. Um, so just hang in there. The tension builds as the match goes on. So if, you know, if there are some short draws, just appreciate it as like a small piece of the whole mosaic, um, of course, uh, I would love to see some decisive results, but uh, you know that's that's not for us to d- to decide. Um, last thing, Ty, before we let you go, so we've gotten we know you're 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 busy with your kids. Um, how old are your kids? Uh, my son is almost twenty months. Okay, yeah, so you're in the trenches basically, <laughs> um, and and you mentioned an interest in in sports. Um, what what else are what else are you into when with your scant free time? Uh, big college sports fan, um, born and raised in Eugene, Oregon. So huge duck fan, not a great week for that. We uh, just <laughs> had our national title dreams and football dashed by Utah and our basketball team earlier in the week got torched by BYU. So a certain state is not my favorite at the moment, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but huge, huge fan. Um, I will say before I ever did any chess modeling, I did a whole lot of college football modeling. Uh, oh, that interesting. was, uh, probably that was the area where I first started. Um, I was a high school senior the year the ducks were uh, second in both of the, the AP and coaches poll, but the BCS model put us third and we didn't get to play for the national championship oh. with uh, Joey Harrington at QB. And, that and the BCS model, of course, had computer rankings as a big factor. So, as a high school senior, that's the first computer ranking of any sports thing I put together was my own attempt to do some college football modeling. And I did that quite seriously for several years, built a few different models, um, got in a little bit into sports betting through it, and then left that in the past. But yeah, I'm I'm not a huge college football fan, but I can't believe how long it took them to put a playoff system in place. Talk talk about a uh, low hanging fruit. Um, I, I have to admit, um, being the kind of nerd who likes to do computer modeling, I didn't hate the BCS as much as most people did in theory. Uh, I'm I'm not fond of what it did to my ducks in 2001, but also when I built my own models, it also didn't have the ducks to that year. I have to admit, <laughs> and. So I kind of liked the BCS, but yes, a playoff model is better. <laughs> okay. Well, when we're when we're digging into college football, we've probably gone gone long enough. Um, probably but... <laughs> there is actually on chess one other thing I did feel like might be a decent place to close on, which is a historical comparison for the match. So after spending all of this time pointing out that while the anecdotes say it's going to be close, it could go either way, the numbers really speak to. Uh, Magnus being a strong favorite. I wanted to highlight uh, the world championship match historically with the closest rating differential to the one we see now is the match in 2000 when Kasparov was rated 77 points higher than Kramnik. Ah, interesting. (laughs) So, you know, yes, Magnus is a favorite, but let's not ignore that 18.5% that the model spits out or that 25% that the bookies at Pinnacle gave. Um, Upsets are a thing in sports, and we do not know what these players have been cooking up in their preparation over the last few months. And um, you mentioned earlier that there's an expectation that Magnus might come out pretty aggressively at the beginning, trying to kind of put Nepo away. And 
that comes with risk. And if Nepo mm -hmm. gets an early lead, that could change absolutely everything, just like it did when Kramnik got an early lead in 2000. So, I mean, it's a great starting point, in my opinion, to have some concrete numbers on the on what's likely. But there's a really wide range of possibilities. So that's, I think, a important takeaway at the end of the day and it's the reason they actually play the games and it's the reason i cannot wait to watch them exactly yeah just days away so yeah so one of the many things to look forward to and of course i immediately my mind immediately went to but kasparov was older when he lost that match so that's another input but just goes to show you you can you know you can torture the data endlessly but at the mm -hmm. end of the day as you say it will be uh it will be decided over the board and starting in a matter of days so i think on that note we should say goodbye we only gave a small plug to the prodigy watch but that's another thing you guys if you subscribe to uh to ty's blog you can look forward to as well as continuing coverage of the world chess championship and uh chess um in the chess world more broadly. So Ty, it's been fun to finally actually talk um, after corresponding online. And thank you for sharing all of uh, these uh, these uh, statistical nuggets. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. We'll, we'll uh, see you online during the World Championship. <laughs> Definitely. Perpetual Chess is proud to be a member of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Be sure to check out their sports and pop culture related podcasts as well. I also, as always, would like to thank Matthew Passy for producing the show. Without Matthew, Perpetual Chess would not exist. And I want to thank everyone who listens to the show, whether it be on your own without telling anyone about it, keeping it secret, or if you're helping to spread the word, all the better, whether it be telling a friend about a particularly impactful interview or whether it be writing a positive review online, all of that stuff helps get the word out and helps Perpetual Chess continue to grow. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those that provide financial support to Perpetual Chess. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible in its current form. And I would like to give uh, special thanks to the following people and entities. Here comes the list. Uh, Chessable.com, David Lazarus of Lasman Chess, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adaptive Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Tharwar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Golick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King Cell, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oplin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Michael Sullivan, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd and Ace Twitch channel, Perry McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flemons, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Rick Rivas, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam. And I also would like to thank the following. Hashtag Chess Punks, who are the adult improvers on Chess Twitter. Ace Vallega, Adam Fowler, Adam Johansson, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Gruber, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Bruno Johnson, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadi, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens, 
of Rose City Chess in Portland, the Chess Dojo, Chess for Charity, Jacksonville, Chess Patzer, Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood. I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskacek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Eric Baldwin, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Mayo Perea, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letard Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeff Davis, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse DeCumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Jones, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagua, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfellow, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Reiferth, Lars Reeson, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanova, aka Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Butolovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davila, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain. Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, um, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard McCormick, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Samson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malagu, the Say Chess YouTube channel and publishing empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwater, Sergey Makagon, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, St- Stephen Miller and Tom George, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, Zachary Hoskin, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone.